as the architect of the modern Indian foreign policy that stands tall and bows to no one. A trailblazing diplomat now turned into an astute statesman and politician with his effortless wit, humor and charisma, he has also become a youth icon for every young-minded home and abroad. With him at the helm of Indian's foreign policy, we can all rest assured that Bharat will continue to scale new heights and will most certainly re-establish itself as the Vishwamitra and Vishwaguru of the 21st century. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor of a lifetime to now invite on stage the Honorable External Affairs Minister of India, Dr. S. Jayashankar. I now hand over the further proceedings to our Honorable Member of Parliament, Sri Tejasvi Suryaji. Thank you so much. Yelrugu Namaskara. Very good evening, PS. So, I have with me a very interesting book that uh, Dr. S. Jai Shankar has authored, which is also very interestingly titled why Bharat matters. And over the course of the next 35 to 40 minutes, we will ask him a few questions around a few themes that he has expounded in this book, which is of great importance to all of us, especially the young of India. So, but before I delve into the very first question about the book, on behalf of all Bengalurians, especially the very aspirational Bengalurians, I want to thank you for uh, fulfilling a very long-standing demand of the people of Bengaluru and people of Karnataka of having here a U.S. consulate. Thank you so much for making it happen. So many of our engineers were supposed to travel to Hyderabad, to Chennai, to Delhi. Uh, and this was a very long pending ask. The last time you came to Bengaluru, you had promised that you will get this done and you have got this done. Thank you so much. Can I, res can I respond? Yes, yeah, please. Um, first of all, let me say, you know, for me, it's always a pleasure to come back to Bengaluru. Uh, I think many of you have heard me say this before. It's a, it's a city with which I have long personal association. Uh, so when I got this opportunity, obviously, uh, I seized it uh, immediately. Uh, I must also tell you, you know, uh, Tejasvi and I keep meeting in parliament from time to time. And for last four and a half years, every time I met him, he would start saying U.S. consulate. Okay. So he's been single-mindedly after me. I think you even, I, at one stage to deflect him, I sent him to the American ambassador. Uh, and, you know, that was Ken Juster, I think, huh? and said, go and tell him you have my support. So... Uh, I did that, sir. Yeah, you know, I know. Uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, I'm also really uh, very glad that we could make that decision during the Prime Minister's visit. Uh, and uh, certainly, you know, this is today a global city. Uh, it is uh, one of the great centers of tech in the world. Uh, and I think it's very natural there should be a U.S. consulate. Uh, so having now got that approved in principle, I will now go back and remind Ambassador Garcetti that he needs to set up shop here fast. Thank you so much. Sir, so this, uh, I had the opportunity to read this book over the last uh, few days. This book is of interest to any young person who is interested in world affairs. There is a lot of economics in this. There's a lot of geopolitics in this. There's a lot also, interestingly, Ramayana in this. Because uh, most of the episodes of current uh, geopolitics, uh, the developments in the world theater that you describe, there's an allegorical reference that you make to episodes from the Ramayana. 
uh, you quote uh, episodes uh, of Jatayu, of how uh, a resurgent India, you compare it with uh, uh, the self-confidence that Hanuman uh, explored. So the question is, why did you, I have a two-fold question rather, because your previous book was titled The India Way, and the new book is Why Bharat Matters. So why did you make the new book Bharat? while your earlier book was India, what is the significance of the change in the connotation? And second, what is the significance of the allegorical references to Ramayana and geopolitics in this book? Um, you know, I think one of the reasons why I shifted from uh, the India way to why Bharat matters is actually what has happened to all of us in the last five years. In the last five years, we have become much more self-confident, much more self-aware, uh, much more impactful on the world. I mean, just think back over the last few years. I think, uh, you know, a large part of the world admires how we came through COVID, the solutions that we found for ourselves. We handled what was a immensely complex diplomatic challenge uh, in the G20 presidency. In fact, you know, a lot of people actually thought it was a poison chalice that this is the probably the most difficult time to take up a responsibility like this. We not only took it up, we not only got outcomes and brought everybody to the table, we actually even got a long-awaited reform there done which was a moral obligation, which is to get in the African uh, Union. Now, we've done other things which has caught the attention of the world, you know, uh, landing uh, the Chandrayaan at a particularly difficult uh, part of the world was, uh, uh, I mean, some of you may have heard me say this before, we were actually in, at the BRICS summit for that. And uh, that evening, uh, you know, uh, through the day, obviously, we were waiting for the moment. Uh, then when it happened, the Prime Minister left the meeting and went to his room. In the evening, uh, you had about 45, 50 presidents and prime ministers because apart from the BRICS leaders, a lot of the African leaders and uh, the Asian leaders were there. And I can tell you the, the talk was on the what we had done, but not just on what we had done the inspiration and the hope and the sense it gave to other countries that, you know, one of us has done something like this and that means actually uh, there's a possibility for all of us. So the idea of India as an exemplar, I think that's something which uh, the younger generation particularly needs to, uh, to appreciate. That what we are doing, obviously, you know, our lives are changing, but the impact we are making on the world today. I mean, uh, we look at digital public infrastructure. Uh, we do more cashless transactions per month in this country than I think America does in three years. So uh, I'm, I'm giving you that, you know, what has really changed? You, even, I'm, I mean, I, I could go back to 2014, say a decade of change, and I... I think the decade of change is critical to recognize because that decade is actually the foundation for setting us up 25 uh, years from now in the Amrit Kal. Your second question, why the Ramayana? You know, uh, my first book had a chapter on the Mahabharata, which a lot of people liked. I got very good audience response. And I'll tell you something about epic and culture because some of my contemporaries suddenly think, okay, you know, he's got into politics and there must be some political motive behind all of this. See, each one of us, uh, I mean, these uh, Rama and Mahabharata, these are part of us. I mean, nobody needs to teach you this. You, you grow up with it. You, you know episodes, maybe not all details of it. Now, when you have something like an epic, a great epic, each one of us sees some value you know, something from our own lives, you know. Somebody uh, could see a lot of ethics uh, in it. Uh, somebody else, I don't know, uh, could uh, 
you know, visualize it, uh, maybe, you know, from the point of view of gender. Uh, for me, as someone dealing with diplomacy, I looked uh, or I reimagined it or reread it uh, through the lens of world affairs, through diplomacy, through statecraft. And for me, if you look at the key concepts, you know, when, you know, what eventually what does Lord Rama do? He assembles a coalition. Assembling a coalition is the most difficult aspect of diplomacy in the world. What is Ravana's mistake? Ravana's mistake is strategic complacency. You know, he thinks he will be invulnerable, but he has forgotten that he must seek protection against humans. Because he thinks they won't, you know, they're too puny to impact uh, him. So what do powers do? You know, big powers sometimes make those mistakes. They underestimate where the challenges come from. Or look, in fact, at journey of Rama himself. You know, you think of him as a rising power who's acquiring skills, who's tested, who volunteers to, you know, help with the world when in trouble, who actually goes to forests to protect rishis. You know, this today we would say is he's actually gone into global commons to do global good. I mean, that would be the parlance with which uh, we would use it today. And in the case of Hanuman, that Hanuman, you know, was, was cursed to be forgetful. And as he actually does more and more, he discovers his strength. And that, I think, is what is happening with us today. We are discovering ourselves, and because we are discovering ourselves, that is why I use the word Bharat. Thank you, sir. That makes, uh, uh, especially at a time when India is rediscovering its civilizational roots and uh, is coming and approaching the world stage in a more reassured manner, the reference to the book, the reference to ourselves as Bharat has a very important civilizational context as well. The other uh, chapter in the book that uh, uh, I personally uh, thought of uh, as very important for a lay audience as a Aam Nagrik or a Samanya Nagrik is this chapter that you title Foreign Policy and You. Uh, because I must also, you know, even if this is a digression for a second, I must say, sir, before the uh, uh, Modi government, foreign policy was seen as something very distant, as something that is the business of uh, a few suited, booted bureaucrats in uh, faraway countries. But I think it was after Sushmaji and your tenure that foreign policy is something that every common Indian feels invested in and understand that what happens in the high tables of, say, in Russia or at the G20 summit affects all of us individually, even back home. Uh, to just give you the example from the perspective of Bengaluru, uh, the recent, the last visit of the Prime Minister to uh, the United States was a, a big draw for the city of Bengaluru. Um, we got the US consulate, we got the international battery company to start a plant in Devanhalli with an investment of $800 million. We got the uh, general electric company to uh, partner with HAL to manufacture GE5 F414 jet engines in India. We also got applied materials to invest $400 million in a research development center in Bengaluru. So this is going to create so much of jobs, so much of economic opportunity. And uh, whether it is COVID, whether it is extraction of Indians uh, during Vande Bharat mission, whether it was from Ukraine, the students who came back, we see now that foreign policy affects us at every stage in our life. Could you expound more on uh, how uh, a, a common Indian, a uh, Aam Nagrik, must invest himself and see foreign policy and what you do at those high tables at G20 or a COP26 or COP27 matters to the common Indian's life? Um, okay. Uh, let me give you two, three examples to, uh, to sort of uh, give a more rounded sense uh, of your of, uh, answer to your question. One, let's talk of a Samanya Nagrik, okay? It could be a blue collar worker, okay? A blue collar worker, let us say, in the Gulf. Now, what happens when a blue collar worker has a problem where they don't have the resources 
they don't know where to go, where they sometimes go are not particularly helpful. You know. Now, look at the kind of numbers today, because we have to understand today, when I said, you know, India has changed, and particularly changed in the last decade. There are today roughly 34 million Indians and people of Indian origin who live across the world. Roughly half are our nationals and roughly half are not. Okay. A very large part of them are blue collar workers. Uh, by the way, a very large part of them are students. There are, I think, about 1.2 to 1.3 million students out at any given time. Okay. Now, is it not the, you know, if we are going to speak about, you know, rise of India, we are becoming influential, our time is coming. Is it not the basic duty of a state, of a country, of a government to look after its citizens? Okay. Now, to do that, you can only do it if you put in place a system. Okay. You, it cannot be that, you know, uh, people know a Jay Shankar or a Tejasvi Surya and call up and say that, you know, help me. There must be, a, you know, in fairness, for efficiency, for scale, there must be a system by which people in distress outside, people in need outside, uh, can turn to the government. This is today the expectation of the average person. And by the way, it doesn't have to be necessarily a blue-collar worker or a student. It could even be any one of you tomorrow as a tourist. It could be, you know, um, uh, when, when COVID happened and borders closed and flights stopped, we could have actually, during COVID, after all, we brought back 7 million people. Now, I, I take pride in the fact that we could, because nobody in the world, in the history of the world, has done an operation so big. But... I also recognize it as a basic obligation that we cannot today prepare for a global economy with mobility, with, you know, flow of talent. And this is something which is particularly important to, to a place like Bengaluru, that to, for preparing for such a world, the government's uh, responsibility, the government's ability, the government's willingness must all change. So, what I have tried to do in one of the chapters of the book is actually to look at myself and my work and, you know, the, the kind of things which we do in the Ministry of External Affairs. From the perspective of the public, what is it they expect from us? That on the 22nd of February 2022, when the fighting started in Ukraine and 20,000 students were there, what was going through their minds about their government? When on 15th of August, when Taliban entered Kabul and there were still people out there, what did they expect from us? I mean, recently, uh, we had, uh, last year, we had a very, uh, you know, there was a civil war. There's still a civil war effectively going on in Sudan. Okay. There were about 5,000 uh, Indians who were trapped there including many people from Karnataka. Now, what is, you know, what do we, how do we sort of stand by them? How, how do we already have systems in place for, for this kind of situation? This is one set of issues. I can give you a, a completely different uh, set of issues, you know. You, we are today looking at a technology leapfrogging, okay? We all know that if, you know, one of the reasons why our lives have changed is because we have embraced the digital world in a manner in which very few other societies have done. And this will leapfrog us, okay? But the digital world is not just being the consumer. The digital world, I mean, if, if India is to go ahead in the world and establish itself, then we must also uh, become part of the big league. I mean, which is why today we are investing in semiconductors because, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, chips in a way are today the critical driver of, uh, of the world. Now, getting technology and getting it in a way in which you 
uh, absorb it and move it forward. I mean, you referred, uh, you referred to the uh, uh, GE4 of, of 414 deal. I was, I must tell you, I was particularly pleased about it for, for two reasons. Uh, it was coming to a chair. And I first came to Bengaluru for the first time in my life in 1962 because at that time my grandfather was uh, chairman HL. I'm actually named after him. Huh? Okay, very interesting. So this is actually my original Bengaluru connection. But the second reason is in, 19, in 1986, okay, think how far back we are talking. In 1986, I was a young a junior officer in the embassy in uh, Washington. We actually had a team which included uh, uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam, uh, V.S. Arunachalam, Roddam Narsima, who headed NAL here. They came to the United States because that was when the planning for, uh, for what is today known as Tejas started. So it has been a very long journey for us. Now, countries evolve. I mean, uh, uh, Sanjeev was talking about how cities evolve, but nations also evolve. Now, I take a project like Tejas, you know, I've, in fact, I had the, uh, pl uh, the pleasure of bringing the U.S. Defense Secretary, then Kaspar Weinberger, to Bengaluru for looking at the LCA project at that time. Now, I have seen how a project like that evolves. The fact today that it has reached a stage, uh, you know, things don't happen by themselves. It may be organic, but even organic things need a driver. It needs a push. It needs a vision. So to me, you know, when I saw the Prime Minister of India getting into a Tejas, you know, you know what a powerful statement it is to, the, to our own defense people, to our own, you know, our own crea creativity, to our own technologists, that I have confidence in you, that I am actually flying up there in a plane that you have produced. So uh, I, w I would say today, uh, a lot, you know, a large part of what we do when we speak of an aspirational world, it's important for us to respond to the to the uh, stand daily requirements, the legitimate expectations of uh, of citizens. So I think the sense of security that you spoke of is something that uh, the common Indian uh, is a. Is, is experiencing every day and you know um, we saw uh, Twitter and Instagram erupt in joy after the um, uh, tunnel workers in Uttarakhand were ev evacuated and uh, you know rescued so the sentiment was that whether you are stuck deep in the tunnels of Uttarakhand or in the hinterland of Ukraine the government of India will come to your rescue and I think that that sense of a renewed security in your government is something that has been a hallmark of the what you call in your book the Modi era diplomacy. So can you explain for us a few characteristics of what is this Modi era diplomacy and how is the Modi era diplomacy different from what was practiced in the pre Modi era? Look. Uh I would say, uh, I mean, um, the short answer is read my book, you'll get the answer. Uh, the slightly longer answer is uh, partly, I think, a new way of thinking. Uh, say, for example, uh, to take our neighborhood and make them partners, not competitors or not neighbors who envy you, but neighbors who benefit from what you're doing. I've just come today from Kathmandu. This morning, uh, I was there at the opening of, uh, of the library of Tribhuvan University. So our neighbors today associate India with education, with health. We stood by them during vaccines, uh, during COVID. Uh, with Sri Lanka, we, 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 we actually uh, were bold enough to put out uh, $4 billion to bail them out uh, economically. They see the new, you know, the power linkages, the, so, so there's a whole the, the change in the, in the manner of which we deal with the neighborhood. If you go beyond that, uh, I think uh, the idea that with the Gulf, with Central Asia, with the Indian Ocean, 
how do you you know because we are actually recapturing our history that because of the partition because of that you know those periods of decline uh, which uh, sanjeev spoke about with gurumurthi ji also touched upon we had stopped thinking of these regions i mean these are actually our neighborhood i mean they were uh, if you go by some, even something like archaeology in the middle of vietnam you know there are uh, there are uh, shiv temples uh, of uh, you know uh, thousand years old plus you know in, in fact as you follow the trail all the way to the east coast of china you can see really how much our cultural and obviously our economic and possibly political uh, activities extended you go the other way around that look at the gulf you know uh, the uh, till the 60s even 70s the indian rupee was legal tender in some of these countries so what had happened was somewhere we we kind of let go of these connections we had a narrower smaller view of ourselves today i think the big change i come back to your first question we are today you know spreading our wings we are making a difference to the world and the world actually wants uh, you know a, a country a power like us uh, today to balance out uh, what are the are the established powers and most important at the big league we are today holding our own that you know whether it is uh, a complicated issue like uh, the conflict in ukraine and the pressures that come on you out there or whether it is what is happening you know what has been happening in the indo pacific and you know how do we ensure that uh, there is stability and there is order uh, now so it could be the quad you know there are pressures on us not to do the quad there were pressures on us to restrict our economic dealings with russia we have stood firm against both so i think it's a combination of a, a lot of this including you know dealing with the diaspora recognizing you know and look at the global issues climate change today technology even nutrition you know wellness i mean there isn't a debate in the world in which today we are not wading into and not putting out our ideas that is the difference and and uh, i think sir this uh, uh renewed voice that india has found at a global stage uh is also reflecting in the way that we are dealing with uh, our immediate neighborhood which also includes china and uh, there's a um, elaborate chapter in the book on titled dealing with china and uh, as a, a, a activist of politics or rather a student of politics there was one particular paragraph in that uh, um chapter uh, or rather a coinage of a word that you have uh, uh, used which caught my interest and uh, i would want to read that you refer to certain sections of indians as chindians as yeah, chindians it's, it's not my phrase okay the inventor there's an inventor of the word chindia yeah as a hint i will tell you he is in some other political party but i'll stop there and he also hails from karnataka ha huh? <laughs> so so there's so uh, dr jay shankar vividly describes the characteristics of these chindians and this is what he says um it is the actions more than the articulation of these chindians that are of deeper concern by consciously underrating the china challenge any sense of preparation in india was undermined till the change of change of 2014 the neglect of the border infrastructure was paralleled by an unwillingness to accelerate industrialization and create deep strengths even now make in india endeavors are attacked by them while ostensibly expressing concern at the trade imbalance with china the combination of politics policies and populism lowered our national guard and still continues to target our national morale not surprisingly this is about as far as we can be from the traditions of realism so there's a sense of uh, you know if i my understanding is that that the shift that has taken place post 2014 in the way we are dealing with china is that we are dealing with china with a perspective of a, a more realistic perspective than any romantic ideas or idealistic ideas about how it should be uh two comments one look in politics 
uh, it's natural that everybody will try to do, outdo their competitors in terms of the strength of what they say. Okay? So I think people should always test words against record, against actions. So, you know, you can stand out there and say, I'm the strongest, bravest, toughest guy out there. I would ask the question, okay, great. So let's see what happened, what actually was the impact on the ground. To me, I, 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 in my book, I've used uh, two examples. Uh, one, who prepared, who actually prepared on the border. Okay. Now, on the border, uh, you know, there was a school of thought, a very dominant school of thought till 2014, saying if you leave your borders facing, the, facing China, unprepared and undeveloped, that's the best defense you can have. Okay. So, now, in fact, the earlier defense minister, A.K. Antony, articulated this on the floor of the parliament. Now, if you, when you actually get into crunch time, what happens? You've got to send your troops up there. Now, if you have decided that you're not going to develop the border, or even if you're going to develop it, very frankly, your heart is not in it. You know, you're not giving it the priority. You're not making, you're not deploying the best technology. You're not pushing people to do that. So, if you ask me, you know, finally, look, the current government will say we are stronger. The previous government will say, no, no, we are stronger. That, that's a debate that will happen in politics. But look at the cold facts. Today, the border development budget per year has gone up roughly from about 3,500 crores a year to 14, almost 15,000 crores. Okay, per year. The, if you look at the road building, the speed of road building, the tunneling, the bridging, we are actually looking at 2x, 3x, 4x improvements. So, what is, I mean, if today we have been able to send and maintain troops out there, which we have done in those large numbers since 2020, it was only possible because actually on the ground, you made a difference. Now, that's on the border. I would say look at something much more basic. You know, all of us today are troubled by the fact that there's a big uh, trade deficit with China. You know, why are, we, why are we being flooded with these Chinese goods? Okay. The best way of not being flooded with Chinese goods is produce Indian goods. Okay. So, to produce Indian goods, what should you do? You should first push for make in India. Now, if the stand is, oh, make in India is not possible, it's a, it's a jumla, whatever you call it. If you say, look, let's assume, let's all make it easier to do business, but if your policy is making it harder to do business and, you know, environmental clearances were, were actually uh, practiced as a tool uh, to, to actually slow down industrialization in this country. If we run down our own industry, if we actually... Uh, make it a point to, you know, there were people who said, it's, we are not competent to do manufacturing. Now, you can't be a, you can't enter a technology world after having abdicated the manufacturing world. You know, an, in, an engineer who has never put his hands on a, on a machine is not going to thereafter be able to talk about innovations and inventions. So, I would say, you know, where, where this whole uh, China debate is concerned, uh, there, are, there is a realist school, there is a much more romantic, fatalist, sometimes I would say even complicit school. I think there's been this constant debate, and it's not a new debate. You know, this debate I've, I've actually brought out in my book goes back to the time of independence. That in 1950, there was a very famous exchange of notes between Sardar Patel and uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. And Patel actually warns of, you know, he's expressing concern about what could be the intentions of China. And Nehru actually says, look, I can't imagine that the Chinese would ever do anything across the Himalayas. It is unimaginable, you know, and we should not be driven by such fears. Now, you know what happened in 1962. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, my, you know, uh, I'm, I would say, it's very important, especially if you have the responsibility for 
the security of your country. To be very hard-headed about it, to be very practical. Don't let ideology uh, kind of uh, confuse you and uh, create situations where actually the price is eventually paid by the country. You make a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, I have actually uh, made a, a, a reference of that line. You say, uh, this, is, this is such an interesting quote from your book. The compass of national interest will guide us unerringly if we do not get distracted by ideological reservations or hidden agendas. And I think uh, in the penultimate chapter where you um, answer the interesting what ifs of history, where you try to understand uh, what were the political discourse uh, at the time of uh, India making these important decisions, say we service China, we service US, we service Pakistan, you draw a, a, a lot from the correspondences that uh, uh, Sardar Patel had with Nehru, his positions on uh, not just China, but our, inter our dealing with uh, both Israel and you, uh, the uh, United States. You also uh, make reference to what was Ambedkar's uh, position uh, with respect to our uh, foreign policy as a whole and how anxious and worried he was about the direction of the foreign policy that the country took in the very initial years. You also speak about uh, Shama Prasad Mukherjee uh, and uh, his position on uh, India, China, and uh, India and Pakistan. And uh, there was one particular uh, incident that you refer to, which uh, I was also not aware of, uh, which took place right after we referred uh, erringly the matter of accession to the United Nations. And uh, you uh, also uh, uh, mentioned how Canada and Belgium and uh, a couple of other countries Western countries at that time, UK, UK, UK primarily, uh, try to uh, undermine uh, the India position. And uh, there was a, a, a sleight of hand. Uh, I would want you to explain because like me, the audience is uh, a young generation audience and we are not very conversant of these details. Uh, this was something new for me as well. So if you could explain uh, A, the uh, difference in the uh, a perspective of, say, Sardar Patel, Ambedkar, and uh, 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 Shama Prasad, Prasad Mukherjee, uh, and uh, what exactly happened, the Jammu Kashmir thing, the UN reference, and the uh, role of UK, Canada, and uh, uh, Belgium at that time. Sure. Uh, look, uh, uh, you know, what happens in history is that countries, governments make choices. We grow up thinking that those were the natural choices. They were the only choices because those choices were made. Over a passage of time, they become like principles of our policy, of our behavior. So somewhere we don't even question. And you know, I'm, I'm uh, of course referring to a past and I think this should apply in the future as well. I mean. I would say 30, 40 years from now, people would, should have the right also to question what other choices we are making today. I think that is very much uh, 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 the legitimate uh, way of, uh, of how a country or a society develops. So what happened in the 1950s, which today people have forgotten, is there were actually debates about what should be our Pakistan policy, what should be our China policy. Uh, the sense was that the, the, uh, the government at that time was too trusting of Pakistan, that it did deals with Pakistan which others felt Pakistan would not, uh, would not abide by, including treatment of minorities, especially treatment of minorities. There was a debate on China that, you know, does, is China a country whose intentions towards India are benevolent or not? Now, and then there was a debate about America, that, you know, we had frictions with America, but there, was a quest there were questions asked, saying, are we doing things which also unnecessarily irritate America, for example, by upholding China's case uh, in many uh, situations? Now, these today, I have presented as the roads not taken, because these were choices. Ka you know, Sardar Patel 
BR, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee, these were members of the cabinet. You had a, a leader like Minu Masani of the Swatantra Party. I will refer to him as well. So what happened was at that time certain decisions were made. They presented choices. Those were not the choices which were made. But today when we look at Pakistan, when we look at China, when we look at America, exactly those questions remain, not maybe literally speaking, but questions about, you know, how do you make judgments? If you are trusting, you know, because you are ideologically inclined, you are hostile also because you have prejudices. You know, so to me, uh, we need to be very hard-headed, very practical, very clear. What are India's interests? If India's interests require us to stand up, we stand up. If India's, require, uh, India's interests require that, you know, we are uh, a little bit uh, uh, more considerate or we manage it more tactfully, uh, we should do it. But I would, not, uh, I would not take a call which is based on whether I'm on the side of that country and that block and this ideology. I would take a call at the end of the day, does it suit my country uh, or does it not? The, uh, the second issue, the UN issue, you know, there is, today it is very clear, in fact not now, I mean it was very clear by the 1970s that taking the Kashmir issue to the UN Security Council was a fundamental error because we, you know, you are taking it to a court where the judge, judges are all stacked against you, that these were Western countries who had a bias towards Pakistan and actually if you had been hard-headed, if we had a good sense of international politics at that stage, we would not have taken that call. It was done, you know, as, a, as actually a misreading of what the world was about. That somewhere we saw, you know, UN, it's a, uh, there's a sanctity about UN, these chaps will be uh, impartial and, uh, uh, you know, uh, neutral arbiters. In fact, we were, uh, you know, taken for a ride by a set of countries who had that geopolitical agenda, who used Kashmir as an issue of vulnerability for us, and they continued to use it till at the, you know, it took us decades to finally take the call on Article 370. I mean, to me, Article 370 was not just a call within the country which we had to take, it actually has profound foreign policy implications. We have closed today a window of vulnerability which we were foolish enough to open in 1948. So while you make references to uh, the past and discuss our, uh, the roads that we could have taken but we did not take, you also make very insightful observations about the present and the future. And one of that is regarding the, uh, the narrative battles that we need to fight in today's uh, digital media age and also uh, the challenge that comes uh, in a theater, co uh, in a conflict uh, 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 zone or a uh, uh, war theater uh, where multinational companies with uh, budgets which are, which are even higher than GDPs of certain countries uh, also uh, come into play. So these two threats that you have amongst the many that you have highlighted uh, are something that uh, I think uh, we should uh, spend some time uh, discussing about. So where do you see in, in, in the coming years in uh, a more digitized, more globalized space, the influence of these MNCs, these tech giants, how are they going to play a role in uh, uh, everyday lives of people, especially in times of conflict? And two, the narrative battles. We see uh, the New York Times commenting about uh, India, you see some other uh, um, agency coming out with a survey and uh, giving India a much lower ranking in the democracy index than Pakistan. And, uh, and that's a narrative war that we need to battle. In fact, on the press freedom, I think they gave us a lower ranking than Afghanistan. Yeah. You know. So, uh, but look, uh, I think, you know, uh, the narrative the battle of narratives is something we should expect because in different ways we are defying the entrenched narrative. It's happening in different domains. It happens in politics. It happens even in business. You know, after all, ratings, you know, when you rate a country, 
you know, you are determining the cost of interest for that. So you are actually affecting them by your judgment. And when you actually drill down, as our friend often does, you will find out that the basis for how judgments are made are often very, very subjective. So what we have seen, and this is something uh, it's been steadily building up for the last 10 years. I expect it to, to reach a crescendo in the first six months of this year. You, can't, you don't need to guess why. Uh, and as elections come closer, we will get, you know, if, if you are, uh, if it looks like it's going a way in which the narrative drivers don't like, they will actually start to attack the process. Now, we've seen that before. You know, they will attack Supreme Court, they will attack Election Commission, uh, they will EVMs. Attack even the common sense of voters, you know. So, so look, uh, that's, that's the way the game is played. Now, we have to, you know, we are, we are sort of big boys and girls now. I mean, we've got to figure this out and we have to fight back. So, I don't think we need to keep taking it, uh, you know, as though there's someone superior out there on whose judgment we all live. I, I think we need to call them out. And that is part of this whole, uh, you know, the narrative uh, contest. On the technology issue, uh, I think it's far more complex because you have, you know, from the, I would say, the, uh, uh, the market-based economies, today you have these big giants, I mean, behemoths, who, who are who have the kind of uh, clout and influence which are bigger than many countries too. And it's something which we have to factor in because international relations as a subject, I mean, some of you would be studying it, you, you tend to think of the state as the, as the unit, uh, as the player. Uh, whereas uh, now you have players bigger than states who are not states. Uh, but at the same time, you have the other side, which is, you have, in the non-market economies, when you have enterprises who are deeply back-ended to the state, you have to ask yourself, say, I, I refer to the digital domain, would you trust your data with players who are back-ended out there and, you know, and you know uh, some parts of that back-end? Uh, so I think today there are serious debates about trust and transparency. You know, where would you like to see your data go? And I think that's key to our digital partnerships. So before I open the uh, floor to audience questions, uh, there's one interesting line that you write in the book, which, of course, uh, uh, caught uh, my uh, excitement. The whole country, of course, is waiting for the 22nd of January for the inauguration of the Bhavya Ram Mandir in Ayodhya. And uh, so, in the book, in the book, you write that this excitement is not something that just the Bharatiyas are sharing, but this is also a matter of excitement deep uh, in South Korea, in Southeast Asia. So if you could expound on how the construction of the Ram Mandir is being seen from outside of India. You know, uh, I think it's important, uh, especially for young people who travel and those of you who travel abroad, to go to those places where our cultural imprint historically has been very, very strong. Then you will realize that what is happening in India is not something which is, it's, it's you know, the, the interest, the following uh, uh, is not limited uh, to us that other societies are following a lot of this because many of them, I mean, you go to, in fact, as once you start moving eastwards from our bound, you can see actually a very, very strong cultural influence. And in fact, the reference I make, if I remember right, is actually to Korea because in Korea, there is a, there is a, a kind of a belief that one of their, you know, that they actually have a connection between their royalty and Ayodhya. So, in fact, even in the last few years, uh, as, you know, we have seen the revival of Ayodhya, we have actually had Korean participation uh, in cultural programs and presence out there. They take it as a matter of pride. So, I, I would say 
uh, on 22nd of January that, you know, a lot of people across the world will be looking at what's happening. Absolutely. So uh, let's have some questions from the audience. Uh, um, so there are a couple of questions that the students of PES University have for you that we really hope you'd be gracious enough to answer. It is not every day we get to pick the brains of the top diplomat of the country. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this, sir. Starting off, sir, the world is currently marred by a lot of conflicts, geopolitical conflicts, wars. And during these times, there is in an increasing diplomatic pressure on India to pick sides from different countries in the world. With the Indian foreign policy, like you said, always puts India's interests first and always uses this platform to spread peace instead of picking sides. So what are the consequences of India not playing by the rules and not bowing down to international pressure, but putting forth its own point around the world? Uh, you know, uh, there are times when it's not easy, uh, when people put pressure on you and sometimes put pressure on you publicly. Uh, but when you stand your ground and you stand your ground repeatedly, two things happen. Those who put pressure on you start to get a bit tired. Uh, they sometimes back off or at least they don't do it with the same vehemence. But you know, a lot of other countries come at you and say, you know, we wanted to say that too. And we, you actually said or took a stand which many of us wanted to do. So, uh, people, you know, there are expectations from the world, from other countries about India. When we take a stand, the world listens. And I think that's why it's important we do. Yeah. Can we have the next question? Uh, yeah. So, so my question to you is about illegal immigration. Do you believe it is an internal threat or do you believe it is a global impediment? And what do you think are the measures one nation can take to you know, decrease the amount of illegal immigration that happens? I think any, anything illegal by definition is a threat. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, and I see no reason why illegal immigration should be given a free pass. Uh, because, you know, look, we work so hard to build our country, our society. I mean, think of it as your house. I mean, would you let a stranger occupy your house simply because you left your front door open or your back door open? So, you know, somewhere I think we need to understand because again, sometimes these are politically driven narratives that freedoms mean that, you know, that there's lack of governance. That's a, that's a sign of freedom, that somehow we are uh, we are good to the neighborhood because we are not securing our borders. Uh, you know, to me, there are basics of what a nation state is about and what good governance is about. And certainly, you know, if I have worked, uh, you know, as hard as we all have done, I would be interested in, in securing what I have done and making sure that the entitled people get the benefits within the society, not those who have come here seeking benefits uh, you know, from other people's work. Thank you. Can we have uh, the mic uh, go around uh, yes, in absolutely. the audience? The floor if, is uh, now open for questions. The mic will be coming around and you may ask your questions. Thank yeah. you. Uh, we will come, sir, but I have, uh, I, I, I am biased towards students here, so I would want to take questions from the students first. So, yeah, the gentleman in the black there. So Namaste sir, my name is Sumuka. I am an MCL student. So my question is to both of you. I don't know, uh, this will, won't be controversial. Will reservation end this country or country will end the reservation? <laughs> Second question to for, sir. So we are dependent on United States. So during the uh, India 1971 war, that same United States was against us and it came off list and it is with us right now. 
it is not guaranteed that it will be in the same friendship so how do you deal with that similarly like with our friends uh, happens friends with benefit some you know how do you deal with this whom do you trust like lot of backstabbing happens so so sure, so sure, sure. i'll let tejasvi answer the first question yeah. um, i i'll do the second the, the first rule of politics and the first rule of diplomacy i dare say in front of him is never to speak when your boss is around <laughs> so always let the senior take the question okay i i i think he answered your first question so uh, so on the second question you know look uh interest change countries change you know it's not that any country has the same you know permanent uh, attitude towards another country because we all evolve i mean if you look at india and the united states absolutely i accept that you know the united states had policies right from the 1950s and 60s uh, and 70s which were hurtful to our interests and what they did during bangladesh was uh, uh, was particularly uh, for us uh, uh, unacceptable but what has happened is thereafter other equations have happened in the world so you know my my business runs to a large degree on with whom do your interests converge Uh, at a particular uh, point of time i mean i would give you the flip side of it you know the same united states after all was also in the 1960s a provider of uh, wheat especially to a country when we were going through famine it has been a partner in many of our uh, big infrastructure in many of our educational institutions including setting up the iits it is today i mean uh, we are in bengaluru it is today a major tech partner and an economic partner so i would if i were today to make a judgment because that is really what you are asking me am i going to make my judgment say on what i see are my possible gains by working with the us for the next 20 30 50 years or would i go with a what is a real bad memory of what it was 50 60 years ago so i i think in a way it's like how human beings uh, you relate to each other you know nobody has i mean it's a very exceptional uh, relationship between people or between countries where everything is great forever But there are ups and downs i mean uh, if you look in fact uh, you look at us and china look at the ups and downs you look at us and russia soviet union the us was enormously helpful to the soviet union during the second world war but within a few years cold war started so this is not you know this is not a one you know these are not sort of bff uh, that you make a uh, decision and then say okay i'm sticking with that forever so that was uh, dr jay shankar answering in the proper millennial lingo <laughs> thank you uh, can we have the next question from this side lest we be accused of not giving space to the left I think I need to report this <laughs> that you are giving space to the left. Yes. I mean here it's okay not there. <laughs> yeah. But still that means that we are in a position to give them space. Okay. Yeah please go ahead. Namaste sir. It is absolutely a privilege to talk to you sir. I'm Vaishnavi from MBA department. My question to you is with the rise of regional and ideological movements how do you see the party system evolving in the next few years also uh, what advice would you give to the young people who are interested in joining politics you want to be like him both of you sir no worries no, please now my advice to people young people who want to join politics is you have a model thank you but uh, you know our, our country has seen uh, i'm by the way a student of political science uh, so i've actually studied 
politics uh, as a as a as a academic pursuit uh, we have had you know uh, national parties we've had regional parties we've had identity based parties uh, it's you know it's it's reflective of our diversity my own preference and obviously that of a very significant part of our uh, country is a society as pluralistic and diverse as ours needs a national party because it's only a national party which can actually integrate the totality of you know of views interests thoughts and somewhere distill from that what is a national purpose that if we end up really as a as a country with let us say many regional parties and we've had periods i mean some of you would remember for example the 1990s and we have seen you know uh, it's it's a broadly recognized principle in political science that coalition politics is actually coalition governments are actually not are very may not be dysfunctional but certainly are not efficient are not purposeful are not impactful so to me actually the fact that in 2014 after 1989 we had a government which had a majority in parliament was actually an enormous change and a very very welcome change because that has actually been the driver of all that we have seen uh, for the last 10 years thank you sir uh, we'll have one last question um, so because i'm afraid we are running out of time so we will have uh, the question from here if you could please uh, is there uh, somebody with a mic there in the first row okay okay so let's take this question hi sir thank you for coming to our university today um one question i have for you it's rather a naive question but i'm hoping to be bold like the tone has been set what do you think from a global perspective is the first step a university like pes can take in shaping the students and faculty not only to empower themselves in a more holistic versions of they can be but also to shape them as contributors to a new narrative of bharat in the global context so if you were to give um, in a nutshell an advice from a foreign policy perspective or placing bharat in the global position um, what is the role of a university in cultivating individuals and bharatians uh you know my day began in a university in kathmandu my day is ending in a university and uh Uh, i i every time i come to a university or please do sit down uh, i often reflect on my own uh, and i mean clearly university is a, is a enormously shaping experience you know i mean years later you would look back on this period uh, and uh, uh, whatever you are a large part of it would be influenced by what you are going through at this point of time uh, in terms of how do you prepare uh i think you are actually all already preparing sometimes without even knowing it that you are all far more connected with the world that your your ambition your confidence levels your your expectations are very much stronger uh, you know uh, in fact again i'm because uh, i i go back to sanjeev what he said about our the earlier generations had a much more limited sense of what we could do and the risk taking the the connection to the world the understanding of the world that was that was far more limited than what all of you have so actually if i had not advised but if i had a wish i would like to be you you know and today you know have because to me these 25 years 
these 25 years ahead of us are going to be the years that will define actually Bharat. That in 2047, uh, in 2047, <coughs> we will be really, I, I think, shapers of what is happening in the world. And it's actually your generation uh, which will have both the responsibility and the opportunity uh, to do that. So I really wish you all the best. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we could not have ended this uh, wonderful scintillating conversation on a more positive, a more higher note. Uh, at a time in history when India is uh, climbing uh, new heights with more uh, confidence, with uh, a never before seen audaciousness, the world has taken note of the fact that Bharat matters that India truly matters. And it is in this context that uh, Dr. S. Jai Shankar's book is, uh, after, I'm saying this after I have read this, and this is not like an Instagrammer saying, please subscribe, like my video. This is a really good book and eminently readable. So um, I urge all of you, especially the young, to please read this book. There's a lot of history, there's a lot of uh, uh, geopolitics, there's a lot of economic lessons that one can draw and understand. And I would want to conclude by the very last line in the book, sir, which has stayed with me. The, the title of the book is Why Bharat Matters. One would naturally expect that the very first chapter of the book would deal with that very question, but Dr. Jai Shankar has kept that chapter and that question to the very last. And in the very last sentence of the last chapter of the book, he sums up his answer. Why Bharat matters. With each passing day, it is becoming clearer that India matters because it is Bharat. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for gracing this occasion. I would now request our Honorable Pro Chancellor, Professor Jawahar Dore Swami and our Honorable Chief Operating Officer. Sure. May I request the Honorable External Affairs Minister to please officially unveil his latest literary work, Why Bharat Matters, on PES University this evening. May I now request our Honourable Dignitaries to please felicitate the Honourable External Affairs Minister and our Honourable Member of Parliament on stage. <laughs>